Welcome to our podcast. My name is Keely Severson, and I'm here with co-hosts Eric Johnson and Alicia Swamy, and we are Exposing Mold. Today, we are here with Professor Charles Swanton, Professor of Medical Oncology. Welcome, Charles. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, Charlie, I'm not cross with you, so we'll, we'll go by Charlie. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> I know that you and Eric were enjoying an interesting conversation about the history of chronic fatigue syndrome and small particulate matter. So I think that'd be a, a really good, just natural flow conversation. So I won't interrupt you, you gentlemen. Thank you. Well, um, Charlie, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work and um, your, your findings of cancer associated with ultrafine particles. Thank you. So um, I'm a lung cancer doctor at University College London Hospital, and I'm a group leader at the Francis Crick Institute um, that you can see behind me. Um, and uh, so I spend most of my time in the lab trying to understand how lung cancer is initiated, how it progresses, how it spreads across the body, and how ultimately patients die from the disease. Um, and we spent a lot of time understanding how it spreads and how it metastasizes. And over recent years, we've been trying to understand how that first cancer cell uh, becomes a cancer cell from a normal cell. And um, you may or may not know that lung cancer in never smokers is a disease that accounts for perhaps 10%, maybe 15% of all lung cancer diagnoses. So it's relatively rare, but because lung cancer is such a common disease, it still accounts for a significant number of deaths every year in the United States and Europe. So and patients often say to me, you know, I've led a healthy lifestyle. I'm, um, you know, in my mid 60s. Um, I've eaten well, I exercise, but I've got lung cancer and I've never smoked. Why is that doctor? And I'm afraid I say to them, I honestly don't know. But there are associations um, of various risk factors with lung cancer in never smokers, and they include radon, um, germline um, mutations or germline genetics, so germline predisposition. And the one we've been interested in is air pollution. And that was established, you know, two decades ago, that the, the greater the amount of air pollution you're exposed to, the higher the risk of lung cancer. Now, as you know, association does not equal causation. And so we set about trying to understand whether there was a causative mechanism behind the exposure of people like you and me and our families to uh, small particulates, ultrafine particulates measuring about 2.5 microns and less, so-called PM 2.5s, and risk of lung cancer. So we found that there's a very strong association across the planet in the UK, in Taiwan, in South Korea, and, and globally with uh, higher PM 2.5 levels and incidence of lung cancer, confirming the associative link. That doesn't prove causation, however. And so the next step was to prove causation. And we exposed um, mice, um, animal models, I'm afraid um, to say, uh, because that's really the only way you can test this, um, to uh, increasing concentrations of particulates that you and I might be exposed to if we lived in central London. And we found an increasing number of tumours um, or, or, or grade of higher grade of tumours in mice exposed to diesel, petroleum, uh, common fossil fuel combustion particulates. And so, so that shows that there's a, sub, there's a causative underpinning to this association, but the question is how? And what, we, what we've noticed from work that's been published in the literature and work from us and others, but mainly from published literature, particularly the Sherlock study, Eric, was the, the um, there is no clear DNA mutagenic signature in lung cancers in never smokers. So these are individuals who've never smoked, who get lung cancer, but they don't have a clear environmental carcinogen footprint in their DNA, quite unlike tobacco. So if you and I smoked for 20 years and we got a lung cancer, you'd be able to see that in the cancer genome because it results in these particular mutations in DNA, these so-called C to A mutations, cytosine to adenosine mutations. Now we don't see that in patients who were never smokers. So that, so some major alarm bells began to, to ring. You know, we're seeing this causative mechanism. We've got this strong association, but how on earth is an environmental carcinogen causing cancer if it doesn't induce DNA mutations? Because traditionally we've always thought that DNA mutations and environmental carcinogens go hand in hand. And about 2020, a group led by Alan Balmain at UCSF, who you must speak to, 
um, published a seminal paper in Nature Genetics showing that the majority of environmental carcinogens tested don't induce DNA mutations. So the traditional model of how environmental carcinogens that you and I are exposed to probably every day of our lives without knowing it, um, causing mutations is not correct. And I think that raises some questions about how we assess DNA, how we assess the carcinogenic potential of compounds and molecules and chemicals we're exposed to in everyday life. But from a lung cancer perspective, raises some questions about how on earth these environmental carcinogens in particulate matter are generating, initiating cancers. So in our mouse models and with human data as well, we sought to understand what expression changes would happen in the lung in, in you know in other words what what in in the, in the sort of skin cells the lining of the lung and um, we call it the epithelial tissue what um uh, response is there in that tissue to diesel fossil fuel combustion exposure and what we found is um so sort of a synchronous response that was similar between mouse and human of a number of different inflammatory mediators one of which was a cytokine or a protein called interleukin-1 beta. And interleukin-1 beta has been associated previously with a wound healing response um, and a way of pre presumably regenerating the alveoli epithelium after, after damage. Now, we wondered whether this response might be exuberant, might, might actually lead to an excessive proliferation of cells and whether that might be at the heart of how cancers are initiated in a sort of DNA mutational independent mechanism. So what we did is we, we, we worked with collaborators at the, the Francis Crick Institute, particularly with Ilaria Melanchi, um, who developed, helped develop this stem cell assay uh, using organoids, which are these sort of 3D models from cells in the lung that grow in, in culture in the lab. And what we showed is that the combination of air pollution and a mutation in, in um, epidermal growth factor receptor that's very common in never smokers, um, never smoking lung cancer, um, drives this sort of stem cell progenitor-like state. Think of it as a cancer stem cell, perhaps. But if you expose the, the, the lung epithelium to pollution alone without the epidermal growth factor receptor mutation, the cells don't grow. And similarly, with the EGFR mutation alone, the cells don't grow. So you need the combination of the mutation and the pollution to induce a cancer. So the, the last question is, well, where does that mutation come from? Because I've said to you that pollution doesn't induce mutations. So where does the pollution come from? Sorry, where does the mutation come from? The mutation we think is a natural product of aging. So what we find is as we, we biopsy normal lung tissue from people like you and me, and I don't know how old you are, Eric, but I'm, I'm 50. If you biopsy a typical 50 year old, you might find and a, a cancer causing mutation in normal lung in about one in two patients in one but normal one one in one normal biopsy and actually we estimate from the work we've done that, that um, in the lung about one in 600,000 cells probably harbors a cancer mutation but as you know the vast majority of us will never ever get lung cancer so there's a mixture of bad luck, i.e. the mutation being in the wrong cell at the wrong time and being exposed to pollution that allows the cell to sort of transdifferentiate into a sort of cancer stem cell like state that initiates that cancer. So what do we conclude from this? Well, first of all, we conclude that traditional models of cancer initiation driven by mutations alone. In this case, is insufficient to explain how cancers form. Secondly, we reflect on the literature and what's been published in the last 70 or 80 years and look back to a scientist called Isaac Berenblum, who in 1947 first suggested that cancers might start in a two hit process, an initiator and a promoter. Now, of course, he didn't know in 1947 what mutations were. He didn't know what DNA was in 1947. But through his experiments, he showed that you need both to cause a cancer. And our experiments fit perfectly with that model. The initiator is the mutation that occurs in our normal cells as a function of aging. We can't do anything about that. That's what happens when cells proliferate, they divide, we breathe, we breathe oxygen. Mutations in DNA happen as part of the natural aging process. 
the vast majority of those mutations will never cause any harm from a cancer perspective at all. But if you're unlucky and that mutation happens to be in the wrong cell at the wrong time, in an individual who's exposed to pollution, the pollutant acts as the promoter and the cancer can start to form. So what does this tell us what we, what we should be doing? Well, I think two things. First of all, I think this opens up a field of prevention, cancer prevention targeted against inflammatory mediators that help promote the expansion of these mutant clones. I think it's, it's a very appealing hypothesis. We might be able to prevent this from happening. But I think more uh, in, the sh in sort of short order, in democratic countries like the US and most countries in Europe, all countries in Europe, we have an opportunity to compel our politicians to lower pollution levels. And we need to think very carefully about how we do that. And I just add to that, that it's worth recognizing that PM 2.5s aren't just associated with lung cancer. We find there are six other cancer types they're associated with, substantiated in the literature very frequently. And most importantly, as you know, they're associated with other diseases as we were talking earlier, including, as you say, from what you tell me, chronic fatigue syndrome, but also uh, in, in my area, uh, neurodegenerative disease, dementia, type two diabetes, premature low birth weight babies, cardiovascular disease and strokes. And if you add, if you add all of those, the burden of that disease together, we're talking somewhere between seven and nine million deaths per year globally, as many as tobacco, if not more. Now, of course, you can choose whether or not you smoke, but you cannot choose the air that you breathe. Incredible. And can I ask, does non-Hodgkin's lymphoma come up to the top of the cancer list? It doesn't, but I think we're probably underpowered to be able to look at that association. Um, since not all ultrafine particles, not all nanoparticles are created equal, some are obviously much more pathogenic than others. How do you feel about silver iodide cloud seeding? I'm afraid, Eric, you're, you're now um, taking me outside my comfort zone. I hope you'll forgive me. Um, okay. I mean, I, I think you're asking some extremely relevant questions. And um, the next steps for us in the lab are to really ask answer what I consider to be one of the most important questions, which is, um, is it the particle size that matters or is it the composition of the particle? I have a suspicion it's the size and it and may not be the, the composition of the particle so much as its size. Uh, that's a hypothesis that, that, that gets deep. These particles that are small get deep into the lung. They get absorbed by a, 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 a group of cells called the macrophage population. And the macrophages release this protein called interleukin-1-beta. And that's what causes the first step. Now, the interesting um, aspect of this work in parallel is that the CANTOS trial, um, you may or may not have heard of, was a primary prevention trial in cardiovascular disease published in 2017 by Rickler and, and colleagues. And what they showed is that giving patients anti-IL-1-beta antibodies to block IL-1-beta, to block its activity, to inhibit it, could reduce the incidence of primary cardiovascular events like angina and, and, and heart attacks and what have you. But very interestingly, also reduce the incidence of lung cancers in a dose dependent manner. Very compelling evidence that blocking this inflammatory axis can inhibit tumor initiation and tumor formation in the lung. And I think that tells you that there is a real opportunity now to start thinking about ways in which we could intervene to improve the health of the population um, exposed to, 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 to levels of particulates that would be considered toxic by the WHO. <coughs> and I just point out that, to apologize, 99% of the world's population are thought to be exposed to levels of particulate matter that's, that's considered unsafe. Um, my understanding is that ultrafine particles are just categorized by size and that's the right. entire concept of nanoparticles and nanopathology That's developed right. as a result of the special surface energy characteristics of a particle that achieves a density to surface area ratio that generates so much surface energy, so much oxidative power that these nanoparticles have special qualities which are not dependent on, as you say, the constituent uh, yeah. element, what uh, nature of what it is, rather just its ratio of size to surface area or to um, density. I mean, it's a 
I mean, it's an incredible statement you've just made. And we are, I'm afraid, Eric, just getting into this field. I mean, you know, we've, we've stumbled blindfolded into this. We weren't expecting these data. This did not conform to any model of cancer initiation I'd ever heard of. For full disclosure, these, these results were mind boggling and, and nothing that we had expected. So we are true amateurs in this area. This is not something I've been prepared for. Um, but to your point, we absolutely have to get our head around this problem. And I think, funnily enough, your, your questions about nanoparticles, this afternoon I was reading review articles on the very subject to, to try to get my head around it and to plan the next set of experiments to address exactly that question. So uh, the reason this was brought to my attention is that when the mystery illness emerged in 1985, we were being bombarded with silver iodide, which are utilized for cloud seeding because they have that exact property of very high uh, density to surface area, which causes them to be nucleators. So they can be spread in the atmosphere and they agglomerate whatever's in the atmosphere, not just the condensation, but all the associated pollutants and it can rain down on you and of course you inhale them. And because of their special properties, the ability to pass right through the lungs and into the blood and brain, there could be an associated pathogenesis. So this, I mean, this actually was the very first theory for what might have got wrong, gone wrong in the environment for the mystery that would, came to be called chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, it, very interesting. I did. I wasn't aware of that at all. I'm. I'm ashamed to say. Um, well, nobody I, is. <laughs> no. Um, and um, as I said to you a few minutes ago, we are amateurs in this field and just beginning to get to grips with the literature and the history behind it. Um, and and from a lung cancer perspective, which is really where my where my specialty is focused on, um, we're we're very concerned about these small particulate. Um, matters that get deep into the lung, absorbed by macrophages, who the, these macrophages, these, the cell population releases this cytokine called IL-1 beta. And that's when that's when the, the inflammatory response begins to initiate and when potentially these cells can transform with the right background mutation into a cancer stem cell-like state. Yeah, and if the uh, nanoparticles are inorganic, they're not broken down, well, they're metallic, yeah. the macrophages will throw themselves yeah. against the nanoparticle, yeah. endlessly throwing out messages of distress. Yeah. So this is, this, is, this is sort of what I'm beginning to think, and I, 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 it's a hypothesis, I don't have any evidence for this at the moment, but I am, in medicine, we're taught something called Occam's razor, which is one solution to a problem is much more likely than several. And given that particulate matter is associated with such sort of, we call, we use the word pleiotropic. Um, I guess the layman's term would be diverse impact on the body, which as I alluded to included strokes, cardiovascular disease, dementia, premature low birth weight babies. We, we think it's associated with six or seven cancer types. It's much more likely that one process is responsible for all of these pathologies than seven, eight, 10, 15 different processes. And there is some evidence that, that, that macrophages in, 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 in some of these pathologies play a role, particularly in atheroma. We were taught at medical school that these foam cells, you know, infiltrate the blood vessels of the arterial lining of the wall, the arterial intima. And those, those macrophages absorb fats and other things that, 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 that they were called pathologically foam cells back in the day. Um, and the, the, the parallels between what we're seeing in, in, in the lung epithelium following uh, pollution exposure with this really exorbitant, exuberant, I should say, macrophage response and other pathologies in, in, in the body associated with particulates leads me to consider the possibility that these macrophages are absorbing these pollutants. They can't metabolize them. They're inert. They're not degradable. And you get this chronic inflammatory response as a virtue of the fact that the macrophages just can't degrade them. And um, perhaps that's amongst one of the 
problems with the whole pathology of of this diverse set of diseases that we're dealing with um, associated with pollution exposure. And that's what we're going to be working on for the next, you know, two or three, maybe five years to try to get to the bottom of. I mean, the truth of the matter is, Eric, I don't know the answer, but we have a hypothesis now, which we're going to test. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think you have hit the nail on the head. Super. Uh, I've been in touch with cardiologists who said that the rate of increase in cardiomyopathy is through the roof, and they have no idea why. Yeah, and, and, you know, we are seeing certain cancer types increase in prevalence in certain parts of the world, and we have no idea why. We have the same challenges in, in medical oncology, and uh, um, I, I, I'm a strong believer that prevention is better than cure, and if we can really understand the processes behind diseases like lung cancer that, that lead to that first cell being seeded, we have a tremendous opportunity to improve the health of our population. Well, I'd like to uh, run something else past you, which is in the 1980s, a strange abnormality showed up, a blood abnormality. And it was a pathologically low erythrocyte sedimentation rate. The um, Westergren test for uh, blood is you take fresh blood in a graded tube and watch how quickly the red cells and platelets precipitate, leaving the clear plasma at the top. And the amount of uh, clear plasma over the course of an hour tells you how much the sedimentation rate is. And normally, in a, even in a healthy adult, there's uh, going to be some settling of the red cells. There's going to be some clear plasma. And what showed up is people who had no settling at all. And they started to refer to this as a pathologically low sedimentation rate. And this was never explained. But it occurs to me that uh, with the recent finding that at least 50% of the, the red cells and platelets are generated in the lungs, not the bone marrow as previously described. You know, we, they always thought that all the, the um, red cells were created in the bone marrow. And now we find it's actually the lungs that direct contact with nanoparticles might be responsible for this pathology. Uh, Eric, honestly and truly, I'm afraid I'm way out, out of my comfort zone now, and um, oh. I couldn't possibly comment. I, I, you know, really appreciate your questions, but this is this is, uh, you know, I know a fair amount about the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. But to draw any parallels with PM 2.5s at this stage, I'm afraid would be premature. Oh, I totally agree. Totally speculative at this point. Yeah, I think, you know, what we've discussed today raises some fascinating questions about future research directions. And um, I, I have uh, uh, quite a lot to do to be able to just test the hypotheses that, that I've discussed with you. And uh, I don't want to stretch it any further than that, if that's OK with you. Absolutely. Um, Really, I, I wasn't. Uh, no, no, no. I know. I, I, I think. I think. You know. You, the way you're thinking about things is fascinating, but this is not an area that I'm. I'm an expert in at all. And I just, you know, it's important that, you know, I'm as measured as possible, and I, I tell you from a lab perspective uh, what I know, um, and what I don't know, and um, I, I'm as transparent and honest with you as possible about about those issues because uh, I don't want to mislead your audience in any way. No, and I just am kicking the tires here throwing out some concepts just to, you know. I mean, I, 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 the concepts are intriguing. Um, I, I'm not qualified to say how plausible they are. Um, um, all I simply say, if, if I had infinite lives, I'd, I'd investigate them. But right now I, I have um, this pressing and urgent problem to tackle with respect to just the lung cancer hypothesis that we've been discussing today. Sure, we can only do what we can do. Yeah, indeed. And and my goal is really just to get researchers together and talk about some of these concepts. Absolutely. And uh, talking is hugely important. It's what we do a lot of um, in our scientific institution here. It's, it's incredibly important. And, you know, I've learned today that silver iodide might be another particulate that I hadn't considered and cloud seeding. You know, I would not have considered that had we not spoken. So, uh, you know, I value this conversation very much.
Well, the uh, Chinese have embarked on a huge program to control the weather, and they are unleashing massive amounts of this. So if, if the theory holds up, we could expect to see some pathology associated with the silver diodide cloud seeding that would emerge as a result of these activities. Well, I have a question. <clears throat> it's just following the conversation between the two of you, it seems like Eric's ideas are lining up with what you've come with a hypothesis, Charlie, in terms of the size of the nanoparticle actually being an issue. So just in theory, just in conversation, when in it, you know, it's like these particles and now maybe silver iodide is on the list, but like wouldn't it be particles really of any specific size if it was the well, nanoparticle? You know, I mean, this is this is the this is the key question that you're raising here, Keely. I think the, you know, we 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 haven't done that experiment yet, and that experiment is ongoing. Is it the size of the particle that matters, or is it its composition? Um, it might be both. We don't know. Um, and until we've got those data, I I wouldn't want to um, nail my colours to the mast, so to speak. I I think I think if if I if I was a guessing man. I would say that it's the, well, it might be both actually. It's the size because they get deep into the lung and it's the composition that they can't be degraded within the macrophage. That would be my guess, but- Would you know, composition in other words, include In other words, shape? I'm sitting on the fence and I, I don't know the answer. Would composition include shape or just material type? Well, I mean, it's a, that's a great question. I mean, I don't know. Oh, um, oh. I mean, if in, you look at nanomedicine, medicine, they've actually yeah. looked into that quite a bit. I think shape probably is important, actually. It's very important. It's yeah. supremely important. Yeah. I mean, if you if you take mesothelioma as a disease, for example, probably following, we don't know for certain, but it does cause chronic inflammatory responses. And it's the shape of these, uh, these um, asbestos fibers that causes chronic inflammatory response in, in tissues. So that might give you an indication that shape is important. Um, and, this and isn't I think, really a question, but is it okay if I share something with you that we learned about um, lung tissue sure. damage? Sure. We learned from researcher Cheryl Harding that stachybotrys spores, even when they're not attached to a toxin fragment, have the ability to damage the lung lining. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot we do to our lungs every day in modern society that damages our lung lining. And mm -hmm. that's why we have this alveolar type two population to uh, regenerate it. Um, and I think that that population cells is there for a purpose to, to heal an injured lung. The problem we found is that is if you keep exposing it to to um, injury, uh, you're increasing the risk that potentially um, one of those cells might that harbors a particular oncogenic mutation, cancer associated mutation might transform into that first cancer cell. But I think, you know, the point I'd like to make just before we finish is that <clears throat> lung cancer in never smokers is, is still rare, you know, and, and um, the risk of lung cancer associated with pollution is tenfold, if not 20 fold less than tobacco exposure. So if you want to reduce your risk of lung cancer, the single most important thing you can do is stop smoking. That's absolutely crucial that I get that message across because I don't want to mislead anybody who, for instance, lives in a city and thinks, well, I'm exposed to diesel exhaust, so I might as well smoke. That's absolutely not true. If anything, there's a, um, a collaborative or synergistic interaction between tobacco exposure and pollution. They, they, the whole is greater than some of the parts in terms of risk. We're, we're getting a, um, early data indicating. So the the bottom line here is that if you want to reduce your risk of lung cancer, stop smoking first. That that's crucial. Um, um, and and at the individual level, the risk of lung cancer for someone ex who's exposed to pollution is still very low. We're talking about somewhere between one point two and two point five fold, possibly, as opposed to thirty fold if you're a smoker. So um, you know, I think at the individual level, the risk of lung cancer when you're exposed to pollution is relatively low. But of course, when you've got 60 million people in the UK, there's a significant number of individuals who are, who are likely to, to, to develop it. So um, I, I think we need to keep this to perspective, but we also need to understand that pollution is also responsible for 7 million other deaths across the planet every year, across those other diseases that we've discussed today. Hence the need to get to grips with particular um, exposures and to consider very carefully this association between human health and climate health, 
and the two are into two are totally interwoven combustion of fossil fuels releases co2 releases particulates particulates damage the human body in many ways uh, and cause a myriad of different diseases and deaths tantamount to tobacco exposure and we have to lower um, our particulate exposure and the best way of doing that is to is to uh, decrease our reliance on fossil fuel combustion thank you so much yeah i had two more questions for you charlie before you go for the day sure. um sure. so you're you analyzed a cohort of forty thousand people in the study and I'm just curious if you um, seen any connections um, within this cohort. For example, did you see that people who were living in cities had a higher chance of lung cancer versus people in rural areas away from yeah. agriculture, yeah. away from kind of everything? Was there a difference yeah. between the two? So, so in the data set you allude to, Alicia, is, is a uh, cohort for over 400,000 individuals um that um where we've got their postcodes so we know where they live and because the uk is very good at collecting data we also have postcode level particular exposure data so we can associate rural versus urban environments with risk of lung cancer and we see a correlation the less pollutants you're exposed to the lower your risk of 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 lung cancer in that cohort um, so, so that seems seems very clear, and it's not just lung cancer; it's six other cancers as well, including glioblastoma, that's a brain cancer, um, um, oropharyngeal cancer, um, anal cancer, and other cancers. So, so it's not just one cancer stuff. And I should say, you you swallow these particulates as much as you inhale them too, because the 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 cilia in your lung push up the particulates into the back of your throat, and then you swallow them. This is just completely blowing my mind. I'm so grateful that you're here with us today. Honestly, Charlie, your work is so impactful and pivotal and important. And I'm just curious, I'm just going to throw this out here. Um, since you're attributing these pollutants to sort of modern industry, like, uh, you know, from gas emitting cars and all that, have you received any blowback from these companies if you're making these linkages to this is the source of pollution. This is what's making people sick. This is the cancers that we're seeing on the rise. Um, is there any issues here with yeah, that? It's a, it's a good question. Um, I'm fully expecting it at some point. Um, the answer to your question is not yet, um, but I think it will happen because it'll be like, I suspect the you know uh, other areas that people have investigated that have, that have been associated with conflict with i guess um economic progress um what i would say is that i'm a scientist you know i don't have an agenda here all i'm doing is reporting nature you know i i i'm as guilty as the next person as you know owning a car with a petrol engine lighting fires in my home um braking having tires on my cars all of which release particulates I'm as guilty as everybody else. Of, I'm polluting the planet just like everybody else. I, I'm not getting on my moral high horse here. I'm just reporting data that speak to the relationship between economic progress, um, reliance on fossil fuels, and 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 damage to the human body. <coughs> uh, you know that's nature. I I didn't invent nature. I didn't, I don't control nature. All I do is I report our observations from the laboratory. I have no economic, political agenda here at all. All I'm interested in is alleviating um, the burden of human disease and principally lung cancer. My, I appreciate disease, it. The disease I, I treat, the disease I, I treat, I, you know, that's, that's, that's it really. Yeah, I, I honestly, I appreciate your honesty in this because it's, it's like we can't, turn back now <laughs> we're at the point of no return so i think logically for me if there is a problem with what we're doing in modern day life um you know the faster we can find maybe a solution for these issues and i think your research is is on that track to first of all recognize what we're doing is causing a problem and then second what can we do about it well, I think, I think I think you make a good point i also think you know if if environmental carcinogens are acting in this way that they're inducing an inflammatory response that allows cells with mutations in to start to expand. I think this opens up a huge opportunity to understand how other environmental carcinogens that we don't know how they work might cause cancer. 
um, and will, I hope, open up a field where we can start thinking about new assays, for instance, molecular laboratory assays to determine risk. Uh, and number two, um, think about ways in which we could block this inflammatory response in, in areas where in the next 20 years, we're never going to be able to lower, for instance, pollution levels, because it's just not, as you rightly point out, not going to be feasible or practical or politically um, um, palatable to, to say, right, we're now going to shut all our um, coal-fired power stations and uh, we're going to stop driving cars and we're going to stop wood smoke and all forest, all fires um, and anything that results in a particular release um, will have to terminate today. That, that, I just can't see that happening overnight. Uh, that's not to say we shouldn't campaign for that. That's, that's, a, that's a decision at an individual level. That's not my decision to make. My, my role is to report the data and for everybody else to make their decisions, what they need, what they want to do and the responsibility they want to take in their everyday lives for these problems. Well, thank you, Professor Charlie Swanton. We appreciate your presence here today and your willingness to chat with us about your research. It's it's extremely, again, pivotal and important. And um, if you have any other things that you'd love to tell our audience, if our audience members would love to connect with you, where can they find you? So I'm based at the Francis Crick Institute. So um, you can email me. My it's very easy to find my email address on on the on the website, or or you can send me a letter and I'll read it in an old-fashioned way and I'll do my best to respond. Fantastic. Thank you again. And thank you to our listeners. You all have a wonderful day.